We're excited to praise him this morning. And now that I'm in tune, here we go. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. Oh, we are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts. here for you to you our hearts are open nothing here is hidden you are one desire you alone are holy only you are worthy God let your fire fall down here we go our shout be your anthem your renown fill the sky we are here for you oh we are here for you let your word move in power let what's dead for you to you all hearts are open nothing here is hidden you are one desire you alone are holy only you are worthy God let your fire fall down to you to you all hearts are Shout a praise. And I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. And I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief, I raise a hallelujah. My way. 
weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me Oh, and I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar
that left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow Cause Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed Last night I was uh, putting my little guy to bed, three-year-old, and uh, I always pray with him before bed, and I lay there. Um, so we prayed, and then I said, hey, buddy, Daddy really loves you. And he was already turned away from me at that point, laying on his side. And uh, I hear him whisper, Daddy, I love you bigger than the world. <laughs> and my love for him didn't grow in that moment. It, it's not any more than it was before. Um, but boy, did I want to respond to that love, to that acknowledgement. And just like that, our God in heaven loves us to the max. Like he loves you beyond your comprehension. We can't even comprehend, no, like not even a sliver can we comprehend the, the vast wideness of his love. And all it takes is for you to acknowledge that. And then he responds and he pours out. And I'll tell you, in that moment, I hugged my little guy. I wanted to, I couldn't give him, him, him enough love in that moment. Um, so we have an opportunity these mornings when we come together as a body to acknowledge God in heaven and to pour out our admiration and love and he responds. The Bible tells us he inhabits the praises of his people. That's what we're doing. God is here this morning. The God who created you on purpose for a plan, for a reason. So I want to sing that one more time and I want to just acknowledge what Jesus, the cost it took for us to have the ability to come boldly into God's presence. We don't have to sacrifice anymore. The, the veil was torn. We have full access. So let's sing to Jesus one more time here. Cause Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin the crimson stain he washed it white as snow let's sing it again cause Jesus paid it all yes he did all to him I owe sin had left the crimson stain he washed it white as snow Oh God, we worship you. Oh God, we adore you, Lord. Oh God, we need you. Oh, oh praise the one.
you for your presence in this room this morning. We thank you for the sacrifice. God, we thank you that we can come boldly into your presence this morning and give you all the gratitude and praise that you deserve, God. As we reflect on what you did on the cross for us, God, we just, I pray that hearts would be uh, in a position of uh, gratitude and to be soft enough to really grasp the, the price that you paid on our behalf, God, that we did not deserve. God, your love is so wide and so deep and we acknowledge that this morning, God. We thank you for the things that you're doing in this place, in this building, God, in hearts, in this community of believers. Lord, we praise you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, remain standing. We're gonna sing that, uh, that chorus again, oh, praise the one. Imagine Jesus is standing in front of you. And you know what he did for you. He went to the cross. He paid your sin debt in full. How would you respond to him? Oh, thank you, Lord. You know, thanks. No, I, th I think there would be a lot of emotion. There would be, there would be some um, outpouring of gratitude to him. And, um, and so before we move into communion, um, let's sing that. And a man... Push the diaphragm. Just say, Lord, you're, I know you're standing right here. You're in front of me, and I'm going to express my, my thanks to you today. Because, man, if you didn't do what you did, I would be doomed, man. I would be doomed. And to know today that you're not doomed, but, man, you have eternal life with Jesus Christ, let's express that. What an opportunity today to come together to tell God how great he is. So let's sing it together, man. Let's sing it together. Here we go. Oh. Uh, what Jesus did for us. So, um, and as you know, it's a two-step process. The, the cracker's on top, so you want to start peeling it back. And um, following communion, you just put your put that cup on the ground, and we'll pick those up following the the gathering. I was thinking when I was, we were singing again, 
I don't think I really appreciated what Jesus did until I realized how much he loved me. Uh, I went through a time when I didn't feel like God could love me. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't worthy. And um, I am an advocate of knowing our identity in Christ, to know who we are. We are adopted into his family. We're part of his beloved and the great love that he has for us. If we allow that to roll through our inner core, uh, you'll be radically changed. And because of that love, he went to the cross because he loved you, he loved me. Uh, it's a, I'm telling you, man, it's a trigger to be so grateful, so thankful, because he could have just left us on his planet hopeless, you know, just doom and gloom and no hope. But instead, he, Jesus came to rescue you and me. And so today, man, we celebrate that. We celebrate that. We, we could be sad today. We could, we could have our, our uh, hankies out crying if Jesus didn't come out of the grave. But because he came out of the grave, this is a celebration. Even on Good Friday, man, I, I get fired up over Good Friday because I know it's not the end. Jesus went to the cross. And he didn't stay there. Man, he broke, he broke out of that tomb. Boom! Walked this planet for 40 days, went back to the Father, sitting at the right hand, and guess what? When the Father gives him thumbs up, boom, he's coming back again. Right? Man, what a day that's going to be. Woo! What a day that's going to be. I could sing a song there, but I choose not to. <laughs> let the love of God, man, let the love of God roll over you. just want to encourage you to do that. So... There's a newspaper article talked about killer tornado, killer tornado's aftermath, and in a specific case, um, amid tragedy, thank God. And it was uh, uh, talking about a man in Indiana who lost his house, he lost all of his horses, but he was thanking God that his family was okay. And um, this man was quoting uh, the newspaper reporter, and his comment was this. He had enough warning uh, of the storm's approach to leave for safer ground. So there was a warning. You could say a flare in the air, man. And uh, he said, thank God. Thank God for that warning because it saved my family. And that seems to be a common denominator when you hear story after story of people surviving storms in life. You know, they hear a warning and then they heed the warning. You hear the warning, you heed the warning. You take the proper steps to find shelter where it's safe. And that's the literal difference, man, between life and death for now and forever. Each one of us are, are facing, there are storms of life, and there's the storm of eternity that is raging against us. In fact, Jesus spoke about this in John 8, 24. He said, that is why I said that you will die in your sins. See, there's a warning there. For unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. So to die at the end of your life, not putting your faith in Christ, you are literally standing in the path of, of the tornado that is going to destroy you. You're saying, I don't care what Jesus did. I'm going to stand right in the center path, man, where that tornado comes down. I'm going to let it destroy me. That's your decision. And that's what people do. Because of sin, man, we abort the mission that God has for us. And we say, no, I want to be God. I want to live my life the way I want to. And because of that, it carries judgment. There is judgment for rejecting God because God loves you. He paid for your sin debt in full. 
He's given you the choice to say yes to him or even reject him. If you reject him, then there's judgment. A sinless God, man, cannot allow my sin in his presence. There's no sin in heaven. And God knew that, and that's why he let Jesus come. Isaiah 59.2 says, it's your sins that have cut you off from God. So living our lives without Jesus is hard, but Dying without him is hell. It is. That's your final destination. And God's warning, here it is. God gives us a warning, but he also gives us a way of escape. (laughs) He does. He gives us a way of escape. We don't have to stand in the center of this tornado coming down on us. That same God that I had turned my back on years ago, I rejected him, I I purposely said no to him. When I finally relented and said, yes, Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. You died on the cross for my sin. Guess what? He was there waiting with open arms. Think about that. You reject him over and over and over again, and he probably thinks, boom, it's hopeless, man. No. When we say yes to him, He loves us. He said, welcome home. That's why my son came. And so, Romans 5, 8, God showed this great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. It's amazing. Jesus dying an excruciating death on the cross, tortured, beaten, nailed to the cross, in our place, absorbing the storm of God's judgment. Think about that. He absorbed God's judgment against sin. In my place and your place. There are Native Americans that uh, recall saving their villages over time from the raging prairie fires years ago. And they actually, this is what they do. They set a fire to stop a fire. They set a fire to stop a fire. And what's that about? They burned the ground around their village to deprive the fire of the fuel that it was needed to keep burning. So when it came to the burned out areas around the village, it just died out automatically. The fuel for the fire had already been used up. They said the fire cannot come where the fire has already been. (laughs) (laughs) And that's what happened when Jesus went to the cross, man. The fire of God's judgment on our sin fell on Jesus instead. It fell on him. John 3.18, there is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. And so this morning, we, we do embrace that free gift of salvation. We're grateful to the Lord that he purchased our forgiveness on the cross. Our sin, every sin, not some sin, but every sin we committed has been erased from God's book. And when the storm warning is issued, man, when the flare's in the air, you can stand totally exposed to that killer storm or you can choose to put your faith in Jesus Christ and find that safe place with him. It's your decision. It's your choice. John 3, 36, anyone who believes in God's Son has eternal life. Anyone who doesn't obey the Son will never experience eternal life, but remains under God's angry judgment. So what is it? You need to believe that Jesus went to the cross in your place. You need to believe that Jesus is who he said he was. You need to believe that God took your place on that cross and paid for your sin debt in full. (laughs) Jesus paid it all. We just sang about that. Jesus paid it all. Jesus didn't pay some, partial. He's on a payment plan. No, he paid it all. He paid it all. So the warning's been sounded, man, hasn't it? We see our world crumbling around us, man. There is a warning. The sirens are raging all around us. We're all in the path of the storm, but there is one safe place. And that place is where Jesus went to the cross. He went into the tomb and he came out of it. 
He came out of that tomb so he could walk into your life. Has he done that? Has he walked into your life, friend? If he hasn't, this morning, right here, right now, you can say, Jesus, I believe. I put my trust in you right now. I believe you paid for my sin debt in full. I put my trust in you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for becoming my spiritual master. And I will live for you all the days of my life. Man, boom. Jesus, 1 Peter 2.24, he personally carried our sins and his body on the cross. He personally carried it. That's why we're grateful. 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners like you and me. Aren't you glad for that? He came into the world to save sinners. I was a sinner. Today, I'm a saint. I'm a man of God. And you are women of God. We are men of God, women of God, because of Jesus forgiving us and putting his righteousness in us in that great exchange when we put our trust in him. So this morning, 1 John 3.16, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. Aren't you glad for that? He gave up his life for us. So Father, we thank you today for this opportunity that we have to remember your great love demonstrated to the world. And that love, Lord, where you put it on the line and you say, I'm not going to force you to love me. I'm not going to force you to put my, your trust in me. I paid your debt in full, and now you can choose to receive me or reject me. It's up to you. I pray, Lord, for those watching online and those in this auditorium, that they would say yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Are we going to sing again? Or? We're going to take communion first? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> things are all messed up already, man. So, you want to take your top layer and peel it back, and there's a wafer in there. 1 Corinthians 11. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Even Jesus is thankful and grateful, friend. You might think, no, he's, he's God, and, but he's God and he's thankful. He's thankful that what he did, on, he did on the cross so that you can be with him. He's thankful. And he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together in Jesus' name. I'm going through the book of Matthew right now, and a couple days ago I came to Matthew 8, 14, and I'll tell you what hit me. When Jesus arrived at Peter's house, Peter's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever, but when Jesus touched her hand, the fever left her, and she got up and prepared a meal for him. That evening, many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus, and he cast out the evil spirits with a simple command, and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, he took our sicknesses and removed our diseases. You go to Isaiah 53, you can read that in its context, but not only... Did Jesus die for us spiritually? He removed the the sickness of sin and death that we were carrying with us. And he gave us eternal life. But he also dealt with sickness. Because you look, 
He healed all the sick. I don't understand it. I'll be honest with you. I, you read through the Gospels and Jesus healing, and you, you, he brought, people brought their, the sick in, and Jesus healed them. People who touched the hem of his robe were healed. And today we can ask, why doesn't God heal like he did then? And I don't have an answer for that. I really don't. But I can tell you that he is a God who still heals. And if you're not healed, don't... Some people might think, well, you don't have enough faith or, you know, there's some secret sin in your life. You don't have to live under that condemnation. You live for the Lord and you leave your life in his hands and you trust him. And I've told our guys here that I really believe, like during times of worship, when we spend time in the Lord's presence, I would just love to see the Lord sovereignly heal people. You know? Just come through and touch people supernaturally. I'm believing for that. But we also pray for the sick. That's a, James 5 tells us to do that. So we do that. But friend, I just try to encourage you this morning. Jesus paid it all. He's here today. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. In agreement, confirmed with my blood, do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. And here we go. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Friend, you're an announcer. Think about that. You think these sports dudes on the radio and TV are the only announcers out there? No, no, no. You're an announcer. You're announcing that Jesus is coming back again. <laughs> Isn't that cool? The blood of Jesus paid it all. Let's celebrate together as we drink. Amen. Amen. Nick.
Amen. Real quick, we have 30 high schoolers going to camp tomorrow. And then the next week, I think it's the next week, we have a lot of junior hires going. And then the week after that, in the next three, four weeks, then we have kids' uh, children's uh, camp going on. So, But we want to pray for them right now, um, about 30 students and then some counselors going too on that trip. You guys pray with me for the high schoolers. Father God, we pray for the high schoolers. We pray for traveling uh, protection as they go down and as they're down there, Lord. Uh, you would watch over them. Lord, we pray, Lord, they would encounter you, Lord, and they would sense your love, Lord, in a new way, and your truths, Lord, and the worldview, Lord, the, a real worldview, Lord, that makes sense of the world, understanding you and their relationships and their identity and uh, their purpose in life. God, I pray even now you'd start putting an expectation in their heart that they're going to hear from you, Lord, that they're going to learn from you through your word, by your spirit. And so we commit them to you this week. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning, I'm Nicole, and welcome to church. We're so excited to be serving our community this weekend at the Mount Horeb Art Fair and want to thank all of the great volunteers who made this possible. Each year, Life Church hands out about 3,000 bottles of water. That is a lot of H2O. This has become a great way for us to share the good news of the gospel with our community with a simple gesture of kindness. If you're headed to the fair today, make sure to stop by our booth, say hi, and grab an ice cold water for yourself. And if you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. Please fill out one of these handy dandy blue connect cards and turn it in at Guest Central where you'll receive a welcome bag. Also, ladies, the last 2023 Summer Supper is fast approaching. The next one will be a fun DIY pasta theme. You'll get to choose your style of noodle and all your toppings. How fun is that? Make sure to stop at Guest Central or register online. And as always, Wednesday night is family night here at Life Church. We have fun studies and activities for all ages starting at 6.30. Lastly, if you're interested in getting baptized, then check out our baptism class happening on August 6th after the gathering. If you could please sign up ahead of time at Guest Central to let us know you're coming, that would be great. And a reminder that if you're a parent or guardian of little ones who might get noisy during the service, please check out the mother's room outside the auditorium, the family room at the end of the kids' wing, room 104, or the cafe, where you can continue viewing the service live on the TV. We want to make sure everyone can hear the message without distractions. That's all I've got for you today. Have a happy Sunday. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, if you want to talk to Nicole in person, she's sitting right here. So she's a real person up there and down here. So, yeah, yeah. Hey, man, we had a baptismal service last Sunday. How cool was that? Huh? Yeah. And if you have not been baptized and you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, it's time. Because to walk in obedience, that is the plan. You put your faith in Christ, and then then your next step, boom, you're baptized. And um, so check out that class that's coming up, and um, you'll, you'll enjoy it. Hey, um, Debbie and I were at the booth yesterday morning, and how cool it was being there and being with some of you, serving, and um, people walking by, talking to them, giving them water. And just to think that we're praying for divine appointments, that God would bring people by and it would become more than just a bottle of water, but there would be an awakening to their need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, right? Isn't that the ultimate deal? So, it's, yeah, it's cool we're, we're handing water out, but there's a bigger picture, and that's where people would, would put their faith in Christ. And so we pray for that to happen. And we have these uh, invite cards. These are going out at the water deal as well. But do you realize that 80% of people come to church because of a personal invitation, friend? Somebody invited you. That's why you're here. And so um, use these cards to hand out and invite a friend, um, a neighbor, a colleague, whatever, and um, have them come check out Life Church. 
Watching online, thanks for tuning in. Hey, we got people watching from Israel right now. And uh, how many of you know that's far, far away? <laughs> right? Yeah. So, hi, Israel. Listen to them say hi back. You ready? <laughs> and, of course, we know people are uh, from all, all around um, participating in the gathering via stream. So... If you have your outline, you want to get your pen warmed up, those of you watching online, pull it up on, on uh, the Life, per, Life Church webpage or Facebook page, and we're ready to go. A pastor once asked uh, his church to pray that God would shut down a neighborhood bar near in their community. That bar had been causing a lot of problems. There was a lot of conflict going on. And uh, and so the pastor just felt like as a church, they should pray that the Lord would would shut it down. And so that evening, uh, they came together and began praying that God would do that, rid the neighborhood of this particular bar. Well, a few weeks later, uh, lightning struck the bar and burned the place down. And so uh, having heard about the church's prayer crusade, the bar owner promptly sued the church. Yeah, man, he was ticked off. And so finally, when the court date came around, um, the bar owner passionately argued that God struck the bar with lightning on purpose because the people were praying for that to happen. Well, the pastor backtracked somewhat, brushing off those accusations. He, He admitted that the church prayed, but he also affirmed that Nobody in his congregation really expected anything to happen. So the judge kind of leaned back in his chair, perplexed. You know, he, he was amused by these statements and finally says, I, I can't believe what I'm hearing. Right in front of me is a bar owner who believes in the power of prayer and a pastor who doesn't. Pretty sad, huh? Yeah. The truth is, some Christians believe in God, but they don't believe in prayer. They don't believe prayer works. They might believe prayer works, but by their actions, it speaks otherwise. Some rarely pray, and when they do, they really don't expect anything to change. Maybe that's you this morning. I don't know how you look at prayer, but uh, on the sign there, prayer works. Does it work for you? We know prayer works. We do know that. Um, God is alive. God, I was thinking about, we've been, we had been praying for rain, and, and God, I believe God is answering that prayer. And, um, and really, we should be celebrating that, you know? Thank you, Lord. Not this wimpy clap like the golfers, you know? But I mean, really, when you clap, For the Lord, man, it should be everything in you, clapping, right? You get into it. You put some zing into that thing, man. Yeah. I like rain and better than no rain. So I don't know how you feel about it. Thank you, Lord. Let's go to the book of Daniel. We're going to pick it up, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. One night during the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had such a disturbing dreams that he couldn't sleep. He called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and he demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. And they stood before the king, and he said, I've had a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. Verse 10, the astrologers replied to the king after uh, the conversation was going back and forth. No one on earth can tell the king his dream, and no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or astrologer. And the king's demand is impossible. No one except the gods can tell you your dream, and they do not live here among the people. I, 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 it makes me... Honestly, when I, I was at the, uh, the booth yesterday, watching people go by, just praying, Lord, 
so many people in the valley of decision. May your spirit become alive to them where they know they need you, Lord. Nebuchadnezzar needed to know he was troubled. And we know that um, Daniel and his friends had been under a three-year program, retraining, brainwashing, etc. You know, they were committed to their core values. They didn't relent. They convictions, it doesn't matter what people around you say or do, but when you have your own personal convictions, and I believe this when you put your faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit, if you let him, he'll drill down into your life as you read God's word and you say yes to it, you obey it, and life change happens. And, and I know this is the way God's worked in my life. He has put convictions on me that I don't care what anybody else says or does, I am, I am, con- I am convinced that this is how I'm going to live my life, Right? People without convictions, man, they just get blown with the wind, whichever direction it's going. I like to set my sail with the, the rudder back there. You set the course. And I'm going to cross that finish line with, by God's grace. <laughs> right? We're going to finish strong, Life Church. We're going to finish strong together. And so, number one, I can't sleep, the king says, and we just read it. And it's interesting to know that this king was the strongest, mightiest man on the planet, and yet he couldn't sleep. He had everything, all the resources at his fingertips, and yet he couldn't sleep. And we know that God was working in his life, and we know God is still working today in people's lives. Maybe people are having trouble sleeping because God is trying to get their attention, right? Right? Number two, I need help. King recognizes that he needs help. This dream is bigger than he is. He figures the gods are trying to communicate something important to him. And he's trying to figure out what they're saying. And so he calls in his specialists, the magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers, and they come up empty. You know, we can't, we can't do it. We, we don't have... We don't have an answer. We, you need to tell us a dream, and he doesn't do that. And so, number three, doom is creeping closer, verse 12. The king was furious when he heard this, when they told him, we're signing off, king, we don't have an answer for you. And that really ticked him off, and he ordered that all the wise men of Babylon be executed. You can see this, and I was thinking about Stalin, and I was thinking about other world dictators, Dictators, not leaders, dictators, where they, anyone they feel threatened or when they don't like somebody, they have them executed. They terminate their life. That's what bad leadership does. That's why in the Old Testament, you'll see that the kings were encouraged to read God's law consistently, daily, because when you push God out of a culture, man, leadership becomes dictatorship. Come on. If you want a healthy culture, leadership needs to submit to the authority of Almighty God. And that's where perspective comes. I am leading under God's grace. I am not better than these people that I'm leading. I'm leaning on the Lord for His wisdom. Right? So, doom, doom. There's a death sentence out for all the, all the wise men. And now, we see number four, death knocks on Daniel's door, verse 13. And because of the king's decree, men were sent to find and kill Daniel and his friends. And when Arioch, the commander of the king's guard, came to kill them. So we see now Daniel, who had never been in the palace during that discussion and conversation with Nebuchadnezzar, he gets pulled into the death sentence because Daniel and his buddies are wise men too. But Nebuchadnezzar never thought to ask them. He got caught up in the emotion of the day. And so Ariok comes ringing a doorbell saying, dude, it's time to be killed. 
And Daniel and his friends respond with wisdom, number one, wisdom for a crisis. Verse 14b, Daniel handled the situation with wisdom and discretion. And he asked Ariok, why has the king issued such a harsh decree? Is that a harsh decree? I think so. I think it's pretty harsh. So Ariok told him all that what had happened, and Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. And we see that through this entire process, Daniel does not go into panic mode. He doesn't freak out. He doesn't go into hiding. Next, the tr- next, you know, takes the next train out of town. No, he doesn't do that. And we see in verse 16 that Daniel went at once to see the king and requested more time to tell the king what the dream meant. Daniel knew his God so well that he trusted God. I personally believe that Daniel knew that God is the God who knows the future. Daniel didn't know and doesn't know the future. God does. And even putting it out there, Daniel was speaking really by faith. I believe my God can tell you what your dream is and what your dream means. He had that kind of faith. And so Daniel walks in and says, King Nebuchadnezzar, I need a little, little time here. <laughs> I just heard about this death sentence coming down. Can you give me a little time? And I believe the favor of God rested on Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar there. And he said, man, um, yeah, you get whatever you need and I'll give you to morning. <laughs> and so Daniel uh, says, okay. What does he do? Number two, praise in a crisis, verse 17, 18. Then Daniel went home and told his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah what had happened, and he urged them to ask the God of heaven to show them his mercy by telling them the secret so that they would not be executed along with the other wise men of Babylon. You see, Daniel knew immediately what he needed to do. He needed to pray. Why? Because that's what he always did. He prayed daily when everything was rosy, when the sky was blue, and he prayed daily when the gloom, doom clouds came rolling in, like this death sentence upon him. He, he wasn't a different person un, under duress or a crisis than he was when things are rolling good for him. So he knew what he needed to do. And... Um, Looking at Daniel's life, uh, in this crisis moment, was there a time in your life that you were closer to God than you are today? Let's just roll that out. Was there a time in your life that you were closer to God than you are today? When was that? Well, we all know spiritual drift can happen. Can it? And sometimes it happens when, not, not even on purpose, we just, you know, you have a slow leak in your tire and it, that, that tire slowly loses the pressure and ultimately goes flat. I had a conversation with someone about 10 days ago and I, I, it was a confession And I I wasn't boasting about this, but what I was saying was I realize how quick I can wander. We're prone to wander. Driving through Mount Horeb and how grateful we are for those roundabouts, right? (laughs) Well, anyway, there's there's a car in front of me. And I have to tell you, I don't like these cars. (laughs) Now, these cars don't talk to me. They don't yell at me. It's just the car, the model. They irritate me. And for some reason, at that particular time, going into a roundabout, I I felt my blood pressure spike, like, like, and like anger against this car. And I don't even know who's driving the car. (laughs) 
it's all against the car. And so we're going into the roundabout, and, you know, it's the two-lane deal. And I, I felt like I was at the Daytona 500 right there. <laughs> and I accelerated around him, and um, we came to the straight part of it. Um, I realized I have a Life Church sticker on the back of my window. <laughs> Because the guy honked at me. I don't know if he was saying hi or what, but he, he honked at me. Um, but I thought, what, what a fool, Bob. What happened to you there? You know? How did that happen? Where did that come from? And I, I don't know where the guy lives. Otherwise, I'd go and apologize to him. But I, I just felt like, Lord, prone to wonder. How quick that can happen, huh? That's why I have to lean so hard and heavy on the Lord. I need him. I need him. Always. And I had had to confess my sin. So I was, that was a crisis for me. You know, not not a major one, but I had to go to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me for my attitude and my behavior. You know? I, I probably gave him a wrong impression of life church. You know, are we all speed Drivers, annoyed by certain cars. <laughs> I need the Lord. I desperately need the Lord. And is there a time in your life when you were close, closer to the Lord than you are right now? Because it's so easy to drift. So easy to drift. Going back to prayer to the beginning where Christians pray, but do they they believe that God answers those prayers? Um, We we need to pause and think, where do I land in that? Kenny Luck talking about you know, drifting from the Lord. Uh, he's a men's speaker and author, Christian author. He says, sooner or later, if you're coasting, you're going to encounter some devilish sabotage. The only defense is to accept that difficult growth always requires ruthless pursuit of God. You have to be ruthless, Right? If you're passive, you know, however, you know, if I feel like reading my Bible today or I'll get to it next week or whatever, you know, I'll just get around to it. No, you have to be ruthless about the spiritual disciplines. Anything else leaves you vulnerable. Remember, you will never arrive until you arrive, as in, hello, Jesus. It's a nice place here (laughs) when you arrive in heaven. The Bible is clear that down here we'll never arrive. We simply keep fighting because more like Christ with every success, remembering that only true success is the one that points to Jesus. Right? Coasting, man. We have to be careful about coasting. There were two pastors that met for lunch. It's a true story. And... For simplicity, we'll call one Jim and one George. Jim and George. And George told Jim that he had lost his spiritual passion. And one of his board members from the church left the church and took several key members with him. The church was also behind in their budget. And George didn't want to preach. He lost his passion for preaching. He felt flat. He, he didn't want to read God's word. He, he just kept the, the Bible on his desk and didn't open it. He didn't want to pray. He stopped praying. He was just flatlining. And George confided in Jim that he, if he weren't the pastor of, of this church, he wouldn't even go there. <laughs> he wouldn't even worship there. Not good. It's not good. And Jim recognized what George was talking about, and he knew that George needed prayer more than any 
limited advice that he could give him. And so Jim asked George if he could pray, and without much enthusiasm, George said, well, okay, okay. And it was a simple prayer. And he asked God to disturb George in a big way and said amen, and nothing really happened. They got up and they left and went their ways. A couple of months later, George called Jim really emotional on the phone. He was very emotional on the phone. And he said, I'm disturbed. I'm disturbed. And he explained with great joy that God had disturbed him. Yeah. He had suddenly become disgusted with his sin of spiritual complacency, of just coasting and cruising and He was disturbed by his lukewarmness and the lukewarmness in his church. He was disturbed by people who were living their lives without Christ. And so he said, I I opened God's word again and I began to read it. And the hunger to read it came back. I spent time in God's presence, he said. I, I, I prayed, spent time in prayer. I let God... Just kind of rest in his presence. And with time, his compassion for people grew and his passion to preach increased. And honestly, he fell in Jesus, fell in love with Jesus again. Again. All by doing the things he did at first. The spiritual disciplines. God disturbed him in the best way possible. And friend, if it happened to George, it can happen to you. It can happen to you. And the question is, are you ready to say, disturb us, Lord? Disturb me. I've been coasting. Drifting. Or are you going to hang the do not disturb sign? See, that's the choice that we're given. Two choices. Disturb me, Lord. Or do not disturb me. I like the way my life's going right now. On cruise control. And in this quiet moment... Friend, the Spirit of God is speaking. I want to be disturbed. I don't want to be disturbed. Which one will it be for you this morning? Father, Thank you for speaking. Thank you, Lord, for your love demonstrated so well by allowing Jesus to come as a baby, as a carpenter's son, to be the savior of the world to go to the cross and pay our sin debt in full, to go into that tomb and three days later come out. And even right now, we know that you live to intercede for your people, Lord. You live to pray for your people. And I believe your prayer this morning is, I pray that we'll be disturbed And so we say, Lord, disturb us, disturb us. Awaken us, Lord, for that spiritual hunger once again, to pursue you, to be ruthless in our pursuit of you, Lord. Forgive us for hanging the sign, do not disturb 
so often when we don't feel worthy, when we go back into that addiction, when we simply take the easy way. Forgive us, Lord. And so what is it? Disturb or do not disturb? Speak, Lord. Speak, Spirit of God. Help us to obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. How high would I climb mountains If the mountains were where you hide Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys If you grace the other side And oh, how long have I chased rivers Lowly seeks to where they rise against the rush of grace descending from the source of its supply. Cause in the highlands and the heartache, you're neither more or less inclined. I would search and stop at nothing Cause you're just not that hard to find Oh, I will praise you on the mountains I will praise you in the mountains in my way You're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful in the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands and the heartache all the same Oh on the sunrise to where you sweep the sinner's past and oh how far would you come running just a shadow on me through the night trace my steps through all my failures walk me out the other side Calvary for the one I call good shepherd who like a lamb was slain for me oh I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains in my way I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows No less faithful in the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is
sand If ever I walk through Wherever I am Your name can move mountain Wherever I stand yeah. If ever I walk through The valley of death I sing through the shadows My song of the sand My song of the sand Whoa. Song of a sin. 